Hi everybody and uh, thank you for your interest in my talk titled Soldiers of Fortuna, recontextualizing the Spanish attack of Brunswick Town, North Carolina in 1748. I'm going to begin the talk with a story, the story of the Brunswick Town raid. For those of you who have heard it before, uh, please indulge me a little bit. Um, for those of you who haven't, uh, I hope that it sets the stage for the rest of the, of the discussion. So on Sunday, September 4th, 1748, three ships appeared off the horizon of the Cape Fear Bar. Captain Edward Hearn was busy building the first fortification for North Carolina's coastal defense, what would become Fort Johnston, located in present-day Southport. Hearn sent out two pilots to help the ships navigate into the river. After arriving on board, the pilots discovered that the ships were actually the Spanish privateer sloops La Fortuna, commanded by Vincent Lopez, armed with 10 six-pound guns and 14 swivel guns, along with La Loretta, captained by Joseph Leon Munoz, and another prize sloop that was sailing in consort with the two larger uh, privateers. The Spanish had arrived to take off away the enslaved Africans who were then at work building uh, Fort Johnston. The pilots informed the Spaniards that the enslaved laborers were actually in Brunswick town observing the Sabbath. And so the privateers instructed the pilots to take the three ships upriver. About four miles below Brunswick town, the Spanish landed a force of about 60 men who would attack the town by land. The ships then sailed north towards the port and upon being received by small boats were immediately identified as privateers. The Spanish opened fire with short Fortuna shelling the town from just beyond one of the wharves. As cannon fire rained down, the soldiers who were landed to the south emerged from the forest to outflank the now panicked townspeople from the south. In the ensuing melee, the British ran away with whatever they could carry as the Spanish, in short order, took possession of the town and all of the ships in the harbor. The Spanish began plundering what they could, ripping the doors off buildings and scattering furniture and looting the homes of the inhabitants, including the lavish mansion of uh, Roger Moore, one of the town's founders. The following day, near the property of Orton Plantation, William Dry, captain of the local militia, gathered what men were available. The alarm had been sent to Wilmington and South Carolina, but by the time that the militia would have mustered and arrived, it might be too late and the Spanish might be gone. So armed with whatever weapons they could find, most of them unarmed, and with a company of around 80 men, the colonial militia resolved to retake the town. On September 6, Captain and his men marched towards Brunswick Town. They stopped just before the town and held a war council, where it was decided that Lieutenant Shank Moore would lead an advance party of hand-picked men that included 12 to 14 enslaved individuals to observe the Spanish movements. Lieutenant Moore and his advance party snuck back towards the town where they observed the Spanish rolling barrels of plunder on board a ship at, at one of the uh, colonial wharves. Moore then opened fire, not waiting for the rest of the militia. Upon hearing the opening salvo, Dry moved the entire force into the town. Now it was the Spaniards' turn to be surprised, and the militia was quickly able to subdue or kill any privateers still in the town, while the rest of them fled towards the ships. Fortuna then suppressed the militia's advance with heavy cannon fire. With the town now clear of Spanish soldiers, the militia moved to take cover at a high embankment to try to prevent another landing of troops, while Fortuna continued to fire its six-pound guns at the town. Then... The extraordinary happened, and Fortuna became engulfed in flames as a terrible explosion rocked the 130-ton sloop, 
reportedly killing Captain Lopez and most of the Spanish crew. La Loretta, which had sailed upriver to chase a ship that was fleeing towards the north, heard the explosion, and hoisting the bloody colors, they raced back towards Brunswick Town. After a brief standoff that lasted the afternoon, Captain Munoz of Loretta raised the white flag, and negotiations were held with Captain Dry on shore. After the negotiations failed, that night, Loretta sailed out of the river towards Bald Head Island, and by the end of the next day, the Spanish were gone. Burial of the Spanish dead at Brunswick Town, the colonists were able to estimate that the Spanish lost around 140 men in the encounter, among them Captain Lopez of Fortuna. They also estimated the total Spanish force was around 250 sailors. The colonists were also able to uh, salvage goods from the wreckage of Fortuna, uh, and uh, one of the um, uh, primary prizes was the painting Ece Homo, or Behold the Man, taken from the captain's quarters of the uh, sunken sloop. Um, and this painting is still hanging in St. James Church in Wilmington as a lasting re reminder of the Spanish raid to this very day. The goal of this talk is to discuss the greater context for the infamous Spanish attack at Brunswick Town to explore who these invaders were and what led to them attacking the port at Brunswick Town. This event marked one of the final acts of hostility in the wars of 1739 to 1748, commonly referred to as the War of Jenkins' Ear and King George's War. Both conflicts represent the North American and Caribbean theaters of the War of Austrian Succession, whose main body of conflict resided in Europe and ended with the signing of the Treaty of Aix-Chapelle in October of 1748. Britain and Spain engaged in multiple declared wars throughout much of the 18th century, and the rationale for this conflict originated in the negotiations made at the end of Queen Anne's War from 1701 to 1714. The Treaty of Utrecht, signed in 1713, marked a transition period for Britain to become one of the dominant commercial powers in Europe. One of the major provisions of this treaty was the, planting, was the placing of the Asiento de Negros to the British crown for a period of 30 years. The Asiento was the monopoly contract granted by the Spanish government to other European nations to supply around 5,000 slaves annually to Spain's colonies in the Americas. In addition to the importation of enslaved Africans, Britain was allowed a single ship of 500 tons to trade general goods in Spanish Portobello. Spain's concession of that single ship is what many historians note as the, an entering wedge in what became a sizable illicit trade where British ship carried cargoes of cheap goods to Spanish colonies in open defiance or ignorance of the laws regarding the, the contract. Officials in Old World Spain t tried to take measures against this growing illicit trade by sending the Garda Costas, or the Spanish Coast Guard ships, to patrol both sides of the Atlantic and prevent British smugglers from reaching Spanish ports. The Garda Costas seized any British vessel they suspected um, of having uh, illicit cargo, and if any goods were seen belonging to Spain, not only the cargo, but the vessel were also forfeited. This famously came to a head, or an ear, when Captain Robert Jenkins uh, famously, infamously had his ear severed during one of the Garda Costa boarding raids. Captain Jenkins then went to the British government and waved it in front of their faces, uh, trying to incite them to war. Whether this is legend or, or, or fact, um, it's uh, 
possible po- it's added contributed to the narrative of uh the rationale for this war so not only did tensions rise with uh shipping interests but britain's new world possessions also grew immensely from 1713 to 1739 britain had an unbroken string of colon- north american colonies that stretched all the way from newfoundland to the newly established Georgia in 1733. As the British ascended economically and their colonies encroached on Spanish Florida, this combination of territorial expansion and commercial disputes associated with the Asiento led to an outbreak of war in 1739. In 1740, one of the first major engagements in North America was led by General James Oglethorpe of the Georgia colony. Oglethorpe raised a mixed force of British soldiers, colonial militia, and Native American allies to mount a a land and sea siege of St. Augustine, Spain's chief fortified port city in Florida. Governor Gabriel Johnston of North Carolina committed 400 militia men uh, to this military offensive that ultimately resulted in the British retreating to the back to the north. A contributing factor in the British retreat from Florida was the first free African fort established two miles north of St. Augustine called Fort Moza. While Spain continued to enslave native indigenous as well as African people via the Asiento, A royal decree in 1693 by King Charles II of Spain granted asylum to any enslaved individual in the American colonies who escaped to Florida. This decree granted freedom under the condition that that individual be baptized into the Christian faith and served in the Spanish militia for a minimum period of four years. This was not a wholly altruistic act because St. Augustine Governor Manuel de Montiano placed many of these escaped Africans at Fort Moza, which served as the first line of defense against any uh, British invasion from the north. The African soldiers at Fort Moza demonstrated their their, uh, value to the Spanish uh, in Florida when a coalition of West African militia and Yamasee Indian soldiers defeated Oglethorpe's forces at the Battle of Bloody Moza. Led by a Mandinga man who had escaped enslavement in Carolina colonies and was baptized as Francisco Menendez, the freed Spanish Africans became valuable agents in Spain's war effort in North America. This war effort was characterized by seasonal privateering raids on the British Atlantic seaboard, with Menendez and others joining the privateer offensive against the British colonies. The commitment of men from colonies like North Carolina to major Caribbean engagements led to a decrease in available militia to defend the coastal towns against raiding privateers. Beginning in 1740, reports began to circulate among colonial newspapers noting privateers capturing British prizes in the the Atlantic. These reports became popular notations in papers like the South Carolina Gazette, from May to September when the privateer fleets would depart from Spanish Cuba to raid in British America. When France entered the war in 1744 on the side of the Spanish, French privateers followed this seasonal trend sailing from ports in the modern day Dominican Republic, often in consort with the Cuban privateers. North Carolina became a strategic point for the Spanish and French privateers with 67% of the total reported prize action happening off the North Carolina coast and the Virginia Capes. Early in June and July of 1741, Spanish privateers established a base of operations at Ocracoke Island with North Carolina, with several ships anchored in Teach's Hole, uh, where the pirate Blackbeard infamously was killed in 1718 by Lieutenant Robert Maynard. Here, the Spanish privateers raided prominent sea lanes, which they could observe from the, ma- from, uh, their, the top of their masts, and they also destroyed property and carried off livestock of the local, local inhabitants. 
French and Spanish privateers also utilized the protected harbor at Cape Lookout, North Carolina, to bring in prizes, take on wood, get fresh water, and repair their ships. They also sent soldiers ashore to kill cattle and reprovision with the abundant stocks of fish found in the core sound. In one of the more brazen acts of hostility, uh, French privateer Captain La Haye, a privateer based out of Cape Francois in the Dominican Republic, along with several Spanish vessels, sacked the town of Beaufort in the summer of 1747. Encouraged by the success of this initial raid, later in August, the Spanish returned and took possession of the town once again. The militia, having been alerted by the previous raid, was able to respond much quicker under the direction of militia Captain Thomas Lovick, and the Spanish were repelled. This event is still memorialized annually as the Beaufort Pirate Invasion, held in August each year. Incursions on British shipping ramped up from 1744 to 1747, and it is at this point that a new Spanish privateer captain appeared on the American coast. Captain Vicente Lopez was a private ship owner based out of Santiago, Cuba. Santiago was a base of operations for Cuban privateers, and the threat of the privateer force there, including its proximity to British-held Jamaica, is highlighted by two failed attempts by British Admirals Vernon and Knowles to take the fortified city during the war. Captain Lopez was a Cuban criollo, or creole, um, which indicates um, that he was likely born in the New World, and this status um, most likely had ramifications for his upward mobility in Spanish society. Lopez, however, was able to gain the rank of militia captain for the Santiaguan Corsarios, or privateers, during the war. At his own expense, and upon request of the governor, Lopez outfitted a small galley to attack British shipping for a period of four months in 1745. Lopez was accused the next year in 1746 of unnecessary violent acts but the governor did not pursue legal action due to Lopez's initial successes in privateering around the Caribbean. In late 1747 and early 1748, Lopez led a contingent of Santiago-based privateers to harass British shipping while Admiral Vernon was occupied attacking forts near uh, Santo Domingo in the D Dominican Republic. That January and February, they seized uh, several uh, ships, um, including uh, one with armed with weapons and a hundred enslaved individuals. By March, Lopez and his privateers took six more ships, uh, with one containing a cargo of ivory and 185 uh, enslaved Africans. Captain Lopez was beginning to make a name for himself and was among the privateers known by name in the British colonies. And it was here in the British colonies that he next turned his sights on. The next written reference directly naming Captain Lopez comes in late May, 1748, all the way north at the entrance of the Delaware River. Based on Captain Lopez's movements, it's likely that he attacked British shipping around Cuba before taking a commission to sail from North America in late March. British sailor George Proctor would later testify to being taken prisoner on the open sea and brought to Cuba by the Spanish. Proctor was then pressed to serve on a privateer brigantine named St. Michael that belonged to the governor of Havana, Francisco Cajigal de, de la Vega, and whose captain, was Don Vincent Lopez. Not mentioning what happened between leaving Havana and arriving in Delaware Bay, it's likely that Lopez on St. Michael sailed the St. Augustine before probably provisioning near North Carolina and eventually sailing north to join with French Captain La Haye, who appears again uh, in raiding ships 
near the Delaware River in 1748. Proctor described how St. Michael, under Lopez's command, was armed with 14 carriage guns and 20 swivel guns, and had a crew of 160 men that would board unsuspecting ships armed with cutlasses and guns. Sailing in consort with St. Michael, we first see La Fortuna enter the historical narrative. With its own crew of 150 men, Fortuna sailed from Havana with St. Michael under the command of Captain Ramung, whose first name is unknown at, uh, at this point. Near North Carolina or the Chesapeake, the two ships were separated. After landing prisoners on the New, New Jersey side of Delaware Bay, Fortuna met back up with Captain Lopez on St. Michael. Fortuna was then sent to patrol the bay while Lopez proceeded to capture several sloops, imprisoning around 45 sailors and looting the vessels. He also captured two shallops that were laden with wheat. Philadelphia, located just upriver uh, in, in the Delaware River, was a, pro was a major colonial hub, and prominent figures like Benjamin Franklin noted the city's vulnerability to Spanish privateer attack. As Lopez made his way to about five miles below Newcastle, Delaware, located just below Philadelphia, he observed a large ship bound for Jamaica was laying in the harbor. New Newcastle had a newly established battery based be because of the efforts of uh, Franklin and other individuals in Philadelphia who were tired of the impunity of uh, Spanish and French privateers raiding in the Delaware Bay. Despite this, Lopez designed a plan to take the Jamaica vessel and attack the town of Newcastle the following morning by sailing in under English flags and boarding the ship. After taking the Jamaica-bound ship, he would then land 120 soldiers and raid the town. In the dead of night, on the evening uh, preceding this impending attack, George Proctor, who was still on St. Michael, stole one of the recently captured shallops. Pushing off from St. Michael, he drifted with the tide until he was far enough away that he set the sail and began to race toward shore. He sailed until, out of fear of being seen by the privateers on St. Michael, he jumped into the water and swam about a mile to, to get to shore. And having been a swimmer myself, uh, swimming a mile in the 18th century is no small feat. He arrived very early in the morning uh, that the next day and set off on foot to warn the nearby town of Salem, New Jersey of the impending attack. Proctor was then taken across the river at 9 a.m. and arrived at the newly established battery in Newcastle just as St. Michael was approaching the Jamaica ship flying the Union Jack. The tide, however, was out and so St. Michael wasn't able to come alongside the Jamaica ship. Proctor, seeing the privateer movements, ran to the militia stationed at the battery and shouting at them, he tried to convince them of the privateer's intentions. After a, a bit of uh, convincing, the battery fired a warning shot across the bow of St. Michael. The Jamaica ship, now alerted to the danger, also opened fire, and after about 30 minutes, Lopez knew he was discovered. The Spanish privateers then gave three huzzas, the 18th century equivalent of the middle finger, I suppose, and then stood off to rendezvous with Fortuna and the other privateers out in the bay. Newcastle avoided conflict, but St. Michael and Fortuna had taken at, at least four, four sloops and two shallops over the course of just several days at the mouth of the river. In Proctor's testimony to the Provincial Council of Pennsylvania, he recounted how Lopez was, quote, of a savage, barbarous disposition and declared frequently that he would rob, plunder, 
and burn whatever he could. Proctor went on uh, to say that, that Lopez frequently spoke that if all the privateers in the bay joined together, there was, quote, infinite, infinite mischief to be done, end quote. Lopez was apparently willing to join with other privateers like French Captain La Haye and others to effectively cut off the center of colonial power in Philadelphia. Proctor also stated how the crew of Lopez's flotilla consisted not only of Spanish and French sailors, but also English, Irish, and many mulatto and African sailors. This mixed ethnic crew was common for privateering voyages during this period, but I want to go into the latter two, uh, which are more especially telling. Irish sailors, for example, often sought ways to subvert British imperial interests after years of subjugation and displacement in the 17th and 18th centuries. In 1741, Brunswick Town narrowly escaped attack when two Irish sailors were captured by Spanish privateers. These Irish sailors tr actually tried to convince the Spanish to attack the home of King Roger Moore, but the Spanish, having lingered too long in the Cape Fear, didn't carry out the attack. Next, there is a growing body of research into Spanish mulatto and African sailors during this war. What the research shows is that many of these individuals who were formerly enslaved identify not as freed Africans, but loyal subjects to the King of Spain during their obligatory service in the militia. This was evidence in the case of Francisco Menendez, who uh, ha a lot of research has been done into, into him and his, his role during this war, but perhaps also most no more no even more notably during the New York slave conspiracy of 1741 that took place shortly after the war began. Among the chief conspirators in the New York plot were, were a group of Spanish African privateers. These sailors were sold into slavery after their ship was taken, but they argued in court against their judicial sentence, saying that they, they should rather be treated as prisoners of war since they were indeed free subjects of the King of Spain. And they protested their, their uh, sentence of being sold into slavery. Not only does this reflect upon their attitudes towards their service to Spain, but remarks made during their trial in 1741 also confirm their prowess as soldiers, with one conspirator noting, quote, while the York Negroes killed one, the Spanish Negroes killed 20, end quote. So armed with 160 fighting sailors aboard St. Michael and 150 on Fortuna, and sailing the coast of the American colonies with the reported 14 other French and Spanish privateers in the summer of 1748, Captain Lopez prepared to leave the Delaware Bay. In early July, St. Michael, under the command of Vincent Lopez and still sailing in consort with Fortuna, made his way to the Chesapeake Bay where he raided far up the Chesapeake. The presence of other privateers operating in the same vicinity suggests that various ships might have joined with the Spanish and French flotilla as they worked their way back south towards Cuba, as the, nearing the end of the uh, seasonal uh, raiding season. St. Michael continued taking prizes in the Chesapeake throughout July, but the reports fade off until late September when it's reported that La Fortuna and La Loretta sailed into the Cape Fear River and attacked Brunswick Town. The narrative history of Fortuna and Captain Vicente Lopez tells the story of how one Cuban Creole sailor could ascend the ranks to become a highly regarded privateer captain in the Spanish colonies. In command of a mixed ethnic crew, Lopez had a successful career in raiding British shipping both in the Caribbean and in North America. Lopez had intentions to complete a joint land-sea attack 
on coastal towns, but while his goal was deterred in Delaware Bay, he was at least partially successful at Brunswick Town. We also know that at least a portion of his crew were sailors of African descent who might have served in the Spanish military from North Africa, or on an individual basis, were able to gain freedom from enslavement through baptism and service as militia soldiers on Spanish privateer ships. Their story highlights um, the idea of agency within the individuals who on an individual basis they could use colonial systems to escape oppression and transform their circumstances through the act of privateering. So to round out the story of Captain Lopez, he was said to have been killed in the Fortuna explosion. He is, however, listed in some sources as among the combatants alongside Admiral Andre Reggio in the Battle of Havana, shown in this image, in October of 1748. This contradicts the existing British narrative. Knowing what we do now, that he was in fact in command of St. Michael rather than Fortuna, it's possible that Lopez instructed Captain Ramung to carry out the Brunswick Town raid, and it was Captain Ramung, not Captain Lopez, who was killed in the explosion. Did Lopez transfer ships to carry out his what he wanted to attack a coastal town? Did he sail back to Havana in St. Michael? These are all questions um, that need to be answered, and more research is needed in Spanish archival sources to continue to unweave this amazing narrative in North Carolina's history. Thank you for uh, joining me in my uh, talk. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, um, if you, for more information, you can check out um, these sources, and if you have any questions, just um, throw them in the comments of uh, either YouTube or Facebook, wherever this is. Thanks.